and welcome to the first evening class of the Convocation. Tonight the subject is the science of religion, the eternal message of Paramahansa Yogananda's first talk in America. As you know, this year we're celebrating the centennial of Yogananda coming to the West. So it's a very important, very um, the perfect really talk to start the week. The science of religion. Master, as we call him, Paramahansa Yogananda, he arrived in Boston on September 19th, so a few weeks from today, about five weeks. And a little over two weeks after his arrival, he gave his first talk in America entitled The Science of Religion. So this, this year, we're celebrating those events and everything that led up to it. We published a new edition of The Science of Religion. It is the, the talk that our guru gave in Boston in 1920 and also has a, a, an interesting foreword in this edition. I wanted to read from it. The foreword says, on September 19th, 1920, the city of Sparta, the first steamer sailing from India to America after the close of the First World War, arrived in Boston's Chelsea Harbor. Among its disembarking passengers was, as described by the Boston Globe, a picturesque figure who has come to attend a religious conference in Boston and later plans to make a lecturing tour through the country. Virtually unknown in America upon his arrival, Paramahansa Yogananda would later become known as the father of yoga in the West. Yogananda's address, which took place on October 6, 1920, at Unity House near Boston Commons, marked the beginning of the work as one author put it, of the man who more than anyone else has made yoga available to the West. This was the, the event that started Self-Realization Fellowship. And so it's a very important milestone. This gives the outward details, the dates, where he arrived. But our guru also gave a uh, very inspiring talk at one point when he was reminiscing about, about his arrival in America and those early years. And I wanted to read portions of it because it gives a different look at this arrival in Boston and the beginning of this work. He was giving a, a talk at a Christmas banquet here in the same hall that we're standing in tonight. And he was just thinking about the early years. And this was what he said. He said it was only a short time after World War I had ended and the first post-war steamer to America, the city of Sparta, was soon to sail. I was told there was no chance of my securing accommodation. As for a passport, the officials were suspicious of everyone and almost no one was being allowed to leave the country. These were some of the difficulties in my way some but not all of the difficulties. You know, our guru had such a hard time getting a passport which took months and months and he only had weeks before the steamer was to sail. Interestingly, our guru had a vision in Ranchi which told him that he was going to the West, he was going to America, something that he had heard his entire life. His guru had told him this, others had hinted at him going to the West, going to America. But he had this vision in Ranchi and that afternoon, he said he packed up his things, went off to Calcutta because he knew he was going. Then the invitation came. Then the door started opening. But he had difficulties. He goes on in this, this lecture that he was giving or this, this talk he was giving. He said, I went to my guru, Swami Sri Yukteswar, in Sarampore. He told me that all doors were open for my going to America and that it was now or never. So I knew I would go. But this is what I wanted to read to you because it shows, it shows what our, our, the guru went through to bring these teachings. It wasn't, um, we can tend to think that these enlightened souls, they have a, such a, they know what's happening, 
They have the strength and the, the power to make things happen so they don't go through the trials or the, or the difficulties that many of us would experience. This is what he said. He said, on the eve of my departure, I went to Sri Akteshwarji to say goodbye. I wept as he bestowed his blessing on me. All the students from Ranchi School were at the dock the next day to see me off. It was a tearful farewell. Sri Akteshwarji had also come. Boarding the ship, the great Gyan Avatar sat like a sphinx in my cabin while I continued to shed tears over parting from him and going to a strange land. Finally, he spoke in his calm, reassuring way. Everything will be all right. God is with you. I cannot begin to describe the feeling of aloneness that overwhelmed me when the steamer left the dock. Except for a few practice attempts, I hardly knew how to speak English, much less lecture in English. I was attired in a makeshift turban and a flannel robe of the traditional ochre color worn by Swamis in India. As was also customary among some Swamis, I wore a beard, mustache, and long hair. Most of the passengers were American or European, and they eyed me cautiously. You can imagine what a sensation my appearance made among them. The voyage took nearly two months. On the 19th of September, we docked at Chelsea Harbor near Boston before dawn. As I watched the steamer nearing the landing and saw America for the first time, my thoughts were very sad. Gazing at the twinkling lights in the harbor, I thought of India and how alone I was here and not a soul I knew. Then I remembered the faces I had seen in vision that day in Ranchi. I have since met and recognized many of them, including some of you who are here today. Others are yet to come. But at that moment on the ship, I realized acutely the difficulty of my situation and felt extremely forlorn. This was the beginning of his starting a work and really forming the finding the disciples and forming the friendships and the connections that he needed to start his self-realization fellowship. He gave his talk, of course, on the science of religion. The book that I just showed you is uh, not only his lecture, but in later years he expanded on that book, added a few other points. It was very... Um, diplomatically given, I should say. He was invited to America by um, a Christian group, the American Unitarian Society. They knew nothing of him or of his, uh, the religion or the practices that he had. And he could have come in and compared what he was doing to what they were doing. He could have um, really given a lecture to all of them on what the purpose of religion is. But he didn't do that. He came and he talked about the very core of what religion is all about. He explained that in, in the world today, every person, no matter what they're doing, no matter what they're seeking, no matter what they desire, they're going for two goals. If you boil it all down to the basics, they want to avoid pain, they want to attain bliss. He said, with the attainment of bliss, people don't know what bliss is. They mistake happiness for bliss, but it's the same. They're looking to avoid pain and attain bliss. And if you look at any action, anything that anyone does, it's those two goals. He said that religion is that practice which brings about permanent avoidance of pain and attainment of bliss. He talked in this way very logically, very... Um, compellingly. And with that, I think he really won over this, this group who was there and very different, who had been educated very differently from him. There was a, there was a little magazine that came out after the conference in Boston called The New Pilgrimages of, of the Spirit. And in it, they talked about Yogananda's address that night. It said, Swami Yogananda was present at our conferences and delivered an impressive address. In fluent English and a forcible delivery, Yogananda gave an address of a philosophical character on the science of religion. 
Religion, he maintained, is universal, and it is one. We cannot possibly universalize particular customs and convictions, but the common element in religion can be universalized, and we can ask all alike to follow and obey it. As God is one, necessary for all, so religion is one, necessary and universal. It is only the limited human point of view that overlooks the underlying and universal element in the so-called different religions of the world. Now, if our guru, Paramahansa Yogananda, was able to um, convey that as the central message of his talk, he was very successful. He was very successful. Um, you can read in those words that there's a real respect and a real uh, appreciation for the way he looked at things. He was very diplomatic, our guru. He knew perfectly how to behave in any situation. I remember a story I heard that Dayamata told of, of our guru that one time he was invited to a, a, a meeting, a kind of a conference or a um, special meal that they were having, some group must have been here in Los Angeles because Dayamata said that she went, she and a few other disciples went along with the guru to, to this, uh, this uh, luncheon that they were holding. And Master was to say a few words afterwards. He was seated up on the head table and uh, the disciples were seated somewhere else in the hall. And as the waiters came out and served the food, uh, Ma said that it was um, food that Master didn't eat. I mean, there was, a, it was, uh, there was meat on the plate, there were potatoes, there were some vegetables like peas. And when they served it, and Dayamata saw what was being served, she thought to herself, and she told us this, she said, oh, this will be interesting. Let's see how Master handles this. Master was vegetarian, of course. But she said that she was watching him on the head table, as were people in the, whole, in the hall. He said, Master, he would he took a little bit of potatoes and mixed some of the peas in with the potatoes and just kind of shuffled things around on the plate without, without actually eating the meat. And then when the waiters came out after some time and cleared away the plates, it looked like, yes, uh, the guru did not finish everything on the plate, but it looked like he had been eating everything. And she said, that was massive. He never, he never would think of saying, excuse me, I'm a vegetarian here. Could you please give me something that I can eat? He would never inconvenience or embarrass a host. He just knew how to behave in every situation. Here, too, in Boston, you can just see that he, he came and he didn't talk about the differences between religions. He didn't talk about what he knew. He talked about something that could include everyone. He didn't divide them. He brought them in. This is what religion is about. This is what we're all doing. And you could just imagine that all of the delegates, all of the other people who were there listening, they must have been nodding their head and with an appreciation for the depth of thought and the, the clarity with which Master gave his exposition of the science of religion. You know, there's a, there's a picture of Yogananda with the delegates in Boston. There's the pictures in that book and in that picture, or in that, um, the picture that we publish, it had to be cropped down a bit because um, you wanted a good enough p uh, size of the people, the faces that you could see the guru, Yogananda, in it. So it's cropped down. The original, uh, there are four delegates around the guru. He's kind of standing somewhat in the middle. But if you see the original photograph, it's nine delegates in a circle, a semi-circle around Yogananda. Yogananda standing in the very middle, his hands are at his side. He's looking directly into the camera. There's a serene, uh, innocent, pure look on his face. He looks, uh, the, of all the people in the picture, you, your eyes just naturally go to him because he was the center of really what was going on there. And interestingly, uh, off to Yogananda's left, as you're looking at the picture, the right. There are two delegates who are standing on the side. They're not looking at the camera. They're looking to the middle of the group, and it appears to me that they're looking straight at Yogananda. And one of them has such a, 
a wonderful expression on his face. It's like you could see him appreciative of this man that he's seeing, questioning maybe who is he, learning a little bit more about um, certainly respectfully you know, being a part of that group. Those two are not in the, in the picture that we publish. But it shows a little bit of what the influence that Yogananda must have had on these people. I don't know that we have any, um, there are any other um, testimonials from that, from that particular conference, the different ones, the delegates who attended the, the convention there in Boston. But sometime in the 1920s, the guru met another minister. And he did write a testimonial about meeting Yogananda. And I wanted to read that because I think it kind of summarizes um, just the profound influence and the, the deep, sincere um, reverence that people had for someone of Yogananda's character. And this was a, a, a letter that Reverend Arthur Porter, he was a pastor in Salem Congregational Church in York, England. He wrote, in one week's training under Swami Yogananda, I have received more genuine education than in two universities and two seminaries in which I am a graduate. The course has been a revelation to me. I have learned the vital difference between interpretation and realization. Already within the week, I have experienced great physical, mental, and spiritual improvement. Powers within that have been dormant have been awakened. Suffering from stomach and heart trouble for the past 20 years, I know no words of mine can express the deep gratitude I feel for such definite release from my physical and mental bondage. Last Sunday, I had the thrill of preaching with a new and strange power. Swami Yogananda will teach preachers how to preach with divine unction. I would that all my brother ministers could come under the gracious and Christ-like influence of a teacher who has a living experience of the truth. These are the, this is the, these are the ways I think that are, um, that Paramahansa Yogananda, or in those days Swami Yogananda made an impression on people. He had a profound wisdom, and that wisdom comes out in this science of religion. An understanding of what, how the universe works, what the purpose of life is, what the purpose of religion is, and how to get to that goal that everyone has. I don't think anything was ever accidental. In studying the Guru's life, nothing was accidental. I don't think there were a number of um, topics he could have talked on in Boston. I think he knew science of religion was the core of what he wanted to talk about, that he needed to talk about. One time, Sri Dayamata had said the very first and foremost principle of Self-Realization Fellowship was the first aims and ideals that we publish. The aims and ideals, of course, were written by Gurudeva many years, uh, some years after he arrived here, when he was thinking about what is the purpose of Self-Realization Fellowship? What is, what is its mission statement in today's terms? The first and foremost principle of Self-Realization Fellowship is to disseminate among the nations a knowledge of definite scientific techniques for attaining direct personal experience of God. That is the first and foremost principle of what Yogananda's teachings are. Attain direct personal experience of God through definite scientific techniques. Again from Dayamata. She said, Gurudeva used to say to us, I can tell you what a jackfruit tastes like. I can describe it, take it apart and examine it and tell you its various ingredients as a scientist would do. But though I went on telling you about it for thousands of years, still you would not know the flavor of jackfruit. 
but if I give you a little part of that jackfruit to eat, you will say in an instant, ah yes, now I know. That same example applies to our relationship with God. The endless words, endless discourses, endless writings about God are not in themselves enough. Blessed are those who listen and read and heed those words. But above and beyond that, the message of Paramahansa Yogananda is that we must taste truth. We must know God through direct personal experience. The science of religion. It was a timely topic to bring to the West, the science of religion. We're moving into a higher age where these kinds of hidden laws, these spiritual um, scientific way of approaching things is more and more necessary. Our guru said the age of commandments has passed. The age of logic is here. You must look in the face of every experience with intelligent discrimination until you understand it. Then you will not be deluded anymore. There is a reason for everything, and in this age of analysis, you must seek that understanding. We're moving into this age. Age of commandments has passed. The do's and the don'ts. It's not enough. It's not enough. The age of logic is here. It's good to understand. It's good to question. It's good to try to uh, live by example and learn from that example. Learn what it does to you. This is, this is a big part of meditation, a big part of the experience of, of going within, learning, experimenting, seeing what it does for your life. Our guru said, the little boy who is forced to go to Sunday school doesn't get much out of that discipline because he hasn't been properly trained to understand why it will be helpful to him. I remember observing the Sunday schools in a Christian community in India. Instead of devotional study, there was a lot of noise and restlessness. The children had no idea how much they could have gotten out of that class. Modern religion has divorced itself from life. It has become a Sunday morning habit with a little prayer and singing and a message. Then it is all over for the rest of the week. On other days, it is all right to fight with one's spouse, to abuse the senses, to kill the enemy, kill one's enemies. The very foundation of religion has been forgotten. Religion must be felt as a practical, personal necessity. Now, as our guru did when he was talking about science of religion, he was talking at a very profound level. But there's another sense or another uh, level that we can look at, and that is in seeking God, in learning to meditate, in becoming better and better at the practice of techniques and the ability to concentrate the mind, to one point the mind, there are other benefits that happen. It's not as if you start meditating and you become totally impractical. Uh, Sri Teshwar had some very pointed uh, comments about this in autobiography. He said, saintliness is not dumbness. Divine, uh, divine, uh, divine perceptions are not incapacitating. The active expression of virtue gives rise to the highest intelligence. It gives rise to the highest intelligence. There are practical aspects of, of uh, seeking God, of learning to meditate, of spending the time to train the mind. There was a study some years ago, about four or five years ago. Researchers at the University of Virginia found that a large percentage of people would prefer to receive an electrical shock than to sit quietly alone with their thoughts for 15 minutes. This article goes on to explain. A recent study in the journal Science found that many people choose to self-administer an electrical shock rather than sit quietly in a room. The researchers, uh, this article says that uh, our inability to, to, sit, to be alone with our thoughts may not be the root of all of our problems, but one thing is certain, we're really bad at it, at least under the circumstances the researchers tested. The researchers brought people into their lab and told them they were going to be asked to sit alone in an empty room for 10 to 20 minutes. They took everything away from them, 
cell phones, watches, music devices, whatever. Next, they showed the participants some random pictures. Finally, they pointed out a nearby button, which, when pressed, would give them an electrical shock. They had each participant press the button, just for practice, and then asked them how unpleasant it was and whether they would pay money not to be shocked again. The participants said the shock was unpleasant, and yes, they would pay money to avoid being shocked again. The researchers then asked the test subjects to sit and entertain themselves with their own thoughts for 10 to 20 minutes. There were only two rules. They weren't allowed to get out of the chair, and they couldn't fall asleep. They encouraged the participants to enjoy themselves with pleasant thoughts, and oh yes, if you'd like to receive an electric shock again, go ahead and press the button. The research team had debated this aspect of the study. It was ridiculous, some thought, to think that people would choose to shock themselves. They were astounded by the results. They already told us that they didn't like the shock, said one uh, scientist. They had already told us they'd pay not to receive a shock again. So we weren't really expecting that people would do that. But at the end of the study, we found that 70% of the men and 25% of the women chose to shock themselves during the 12 minutes instead of just sitting there and entertaining themselves with their thoughts. Why would some do this? someone do this? Why is it so hard to entertain ourselves with our thoughts that we're willing to turn to almost anything, it seems, to avoid it? This study at the university started with college students, so the researchers wondered if the young subjects were just overly fidgety, not being allowed to tweet or text or check their emails. So they reached out to the wider community for volunteers, and they got pretty much the same results. There were adults far past college age, and we had them sit in their homes without the shock, since we weren't there to supervise them, and asked them to do the same thing, just sit there at a time of their own choosing when they were alone, and entertain themselves with their thoughts for 10 to 15 minutes. And again, they were terrible at it. They started asking questions, how can we help people think better, the researchers, and what we found to our surprise is that people really can't do this very well at all. The article goes on to say, perhaps it is an issue of mental control. Most people often get lost in thought while walking down the street, taking a shower, or remembering a recent vacation. So it's not that we can never employ, enjoy thinking, but something about doing it on command at a certain time and deliberately is really, really hard, which suggests it may be an issue of mental control. They did find a small correlation between people who had experience with meditation and the ability to do the kind of thinking tested in the study, but it didn't, ex didn't explain all of the results. It wasn't the key they were looking for. Maybe if they focused specifically on people with more meditation experience, they would get different results, she wonders. Now, I don't know. I mean, I, hard, to, hard to speculate what the answer is here. But I would think that most people in the world don't have an ability to turn things within them. Most people in the world are living by the sensations that they receive around them. And when those sensations are taken away, they're lost. Through meditation, through learning to meditate, we learn to be at peace with ourselves. We learn to be under control. I know I can sit for 15 minutes without, uh, that would not be, and most, most of you who practice yoga, who practice meditation, would have the same kind of results. It doesn't seem that hard. You know, during this uh, coronavirus epidemic, uh, pandemic, um, there was a member up at Berkeley Temple, I'm the minister up there, and I was talking with him and he said, that it was surprising to him, a good reminder to him, that when this happened and when everyone was asked to stay home and to, and to um, really change their routines, their outer routines, he said he was fine with it. He found himself meditating more. He had more time. He wasn't commuting so much. And he said to me, he said, you know, our guru really prepares us in a way that you would never expect, that something like this is something not only that we can, um, we can be okay with, we can really thrive in that environment. When you meditate, when you learn to 
find an environment within that you can tune in with. It doesn't matter where you are. There was a famous English poet, poem to Althea in prison, uh, the, the poem written by Richard Lovelace back in the 1700s. Stone walls do not a prison make, nor iron bars a cage. Minds innocent and quiet take that for a hermitage. If I have freedom in my love, and in my soul am free, angels alone that soar above enjoy such liberty. It doesn't matter the environment you find yourself in. If you have that ability to have a to turn things within, to have an inner life, which meditation teaches us to do. You avoid many of the difficulties that most people go through, such as these uh, people who are in this experiment. Your life is much richer. You have more, um, more to propel you forward. I remember in the, for many years I, had the privilege of working uh, with Diamata. I was one of the monks in her office. Um, and I was there for almost 20 years. And I always, I learned a lot just by being around her, even if she didn't say anything that was uh, uh, just being in her presence. But early on, I remember in, the, in her office, um, she would call different monks up and you would go up to visit her in her study She'd be working on something. And sometimes she would call you on the phone. You'd, you'd run upstairs to, the, to, the, to her study here in this building. And by the time you got there, Diamata was involved in something else. She always had so much going on. But she told us early on, and she told me, she said, you know, when Master was busy and we were in his presence, he would tell us, don't waste your time. Close your eyes and meditate. Practice the presence. Make, make use of that time. Build an inner environment. So we got very used to that. We would go up and uh, sit across from her desk. She'd be involved in something else. You'd sit there, you'd meditate, which was uh, very pleasant, by the way. It wasn't uh, considered uh, an inconvenience at all. But learning that, learning to use your time, no matter where you are, we all have downtime where we're sitting and we're waiting. Um, we don't have anything outwardly to do. We have to develop that ability to have a relationship within, to talk to God, to practice the presence. Brother Bhaktananda was another one, of course, with the practicing the presence. He was a, the oldest disciple when I came here. Oldest meaning he came in 1937 and was uh, one of the original disciples of Guruji. And he lived over in Hollywood, at the Hollywood Temple for many years. And I served there at Hollywood for, I was uh, transferred there for a couple of years. Wonderful to be around him, wonderful to see him in action. But he told me when I first got there, he said, now don't, don't expect me to be giving you satsangs and be talking to you all the time. He said, when I'm out with the members, that's what's expected of me. He says, but here, and I got it right away. I knew exactly what he was talking about. He, he didn't idly talk. He didn't um, spend his time just kind of um, being, uh, being outward. He always had something going on. You could see his mind was in, inward and withdrawn. And really, that, that's why he was such a great, great soul. He, was, uh, he had this ability to turn things within. He had a rich relationship with the divine. And uh, when he was in the ashram among the monks, he appreciated silence. He appreciated just respecting the fact that he was, uh, he had more important things to do than to just sit and talk. He was quite an example, as many of those uh, early disciples were. What is the science? You know, we're talking about the science of religion. Swami Sri Teshwar, an autobiography of a yogi. He said, all creation is governed by law. Sri Yukteswar concluded, uh, Sri Yukteswar said, the principles that operate in the outer universe, discoverable by scientists, are called natural laws. 
but there are subtler laws that rule the hidden spiritual planes in the inner realms of consciousness. These principles are knowable through the science of yoga. And our guru, talking about the same principle, said, law governs everything in the universe, yet most people have never tried to apply the scientific law of experimentation and research to test religious doctrines. They simply believe, thinking it impossible to investigate and prove the scriptural texts. We have only to believe, they assure themselves and others, and that is to be accepted as all there is to religion. Well, it's much more than that. Our guru said that there's something, there's a science behind it. And that science has been studied in India. It's been passed down from the golden age where rishis, you know, these sages, these advanced souls studied what is the way in which we can contact God, in which we can really uh, get to a place where we permanently avoid pain and we attain that bliss that the soul is seeking. Our guru has a wonderful definition, often given by me because it, it means so much. He talks about yoga and yoga meditation in particular. Yoga meditation is the process of cultivating and stabilizing an awareness of our real nature through definite spiritual and psychophysical methods and laws by which the narrow ego, the flawed hereditary human consciousness, is displaced by the consciousness of the soul. This is what the science of religion is about, that yoga meditation in which we gradually learn to displace the ego with the consciousness of the soul. Now, our guru came to the West to bring techniques. You're learning them here at Convocation, techniques that take you to, um, to a deeper and deeper state. And you start realizing that yoga can do that. You start realizing that you're not quite the same as you meditate through the years. That gradually this displacement occurs. You're less ego and more divinely centered. It's very true. It's very, those who uh, stay with it through the years have always say that that's the case. Master said, yoga is the heart of all religions. It is the science of religion by which the true principles of religion can be proven with exact and known results. Yoga fulfills the purpose of religion, achievement of oneness or union with God, the ultimate necessity of every soul. It fulfills the purpose of religion, achievement of oneness or union with God. Now, is it necessary? Um, we've had examples of saints who are not, don't practice yoga or don't practice um, meditation even, at least not as in the style that or the, or the understanding that we know of it. Is it possible to attain those higher states? Yes, it is. I remember early on, early, I was a young monk. I was working in Dayamata's office and I'd seen a picture of Padre Pio, the Italian saint, the stigmatist, he had the wounds of Christ on his hands and his feet. And there was a picture of him in some book that I had seen. He was a young man, a young monk, and he had evidently been ordered by the bishop to stand in front of a camera. They wanted to document that, you know, the, the wounds that he had on his hands. And he was standing there with his hands across his, his chest like this. You could see the, the wounds. He had a look of utter disgust on his face. <laughs> he didn't like this at all. He was ordered to do it. He was very private about this. Um, this was his relationship with the divine. He didn't want it to be public, but he did it. He was asked to do it. He was kind of looking to the side. But the overall picture had a feeling of a real saintly soul. I mean, it just was very magnetic to look at. So one time I asked Diamo, I said, uh, Ma, I saw this, this book, I saw this picture of Padre Pio. He was standing there, explained it all. I said, how did he become so holy? You know, I mean, I wanted to hear what, what she had to say. And as Diamata often did, when you asked her a question, any kind of spiritual question or something, that 
She'd be silent for a moment. You'd look off to the side a little bit. And then she said, well, he did it through devotion. He practiced the presence of God. And he didn't spend all of his time with his brother monks. Solitude. He used those three things in, in order to attain that kind of uh, sanctity, that holiness. It is possible. It is possible. In fact, in the autobiography of a yogi, Paramahansa Yogananda has this, this uh, little passage, and it's near the end of the book. He said, Brother Lawrence, the 17th century Christian mystic, tells us his first glimpse of God realization came about by viewing a tree. Nearly all human beings have seen a tree. Few, alas, have thereby seen the tree's creator. Most men are utterly incapable of summoning those irresistible powers of devotion that are effortlessly possessed by only a few single-hearted saints found in all religious paths, whether of East or West. Yet, the ordinary person is not therefore shut out from the possibility of divine communion. He needs for soul recollection no more than the Kriya Yoga technique, daily observance of the moral precepts, and an, abil and an ability to cry sincerely, Lord, I yearn to know Thee. And he finishes off that thought, the universal appeal of yoga is thus its approach to God through daily usable scientific method rather than through a devotional fervor that for the average man is beyond his emotional scope. Most people are not capable of doing what Brother Lawrence did or what a Padre Pio did or these other saints. They just don't have that emotional scope. What do you do? Well, you practice the scientific method for attaining that kind of attunement and that kind of... Uh, uh, vibration with, with the, the Lord of the universe. And that those, those uh, paths, you know, our guru often said, they all do good. They all, um, if it's true path, if it's a true, um, sincere religion, they're all beneficial. But he explained it this way. He said, travelers to New York from different parts of the country will journey along different routes. But when they reach New York, they will all see the same thing. Every true religion leads to God. But some paths take longer time, while others are shorter. No matter what God-ordained religion one follows, its beliefs will merge in one and the same common experience of God. Yoga is the unifying path that is followed by all religionists as they make the final approach to God. Yoga. Before one can reach God, there has to be a withdrawal of the life force and mind inward to rise through the spiritualizing centers of the spine to the supreme states of divine realization. The final union with God and the stages involved in this union are universal. That is yoga, the science of religion. Now, some of us would say, well, that's nice to know, um, but, uh, you know, I'm good. I don't need it. I, I think it's, uh, I'm okay. I don't really want to make that kind of effort. I'm not interested in becoming a saint or I'm not interested. You know, our, our guru, Paramahansa Yogananda, he has a poem in Autobiography of a Yogi called Samadhi. He used to tell people, he used to um, ask people to memorize it because it, it, was, it spells out the goal that we're seeking and what it's like to attain this cosmic consciousness that is the goal of all people, all, all men and women around the world. What is the goal? There's another wonderful explanation of what cosmic consciousness is. And that, it was in a, a, an essay that was written by Taramata. Taramata was one of the original disciples of Yogananda. She met him in 1924 in San Francisco. And she described a, you know, this consciousness of being caught up in, in this spiritual um, 
cosmic consciousness. Uh, she, she had a, a divine uh, vision and she wrote about it. And I wanted to read a portion of it because it does show what we're really striving for and what, we're, uh, what the final goal is. It was in a little article called The Forerunner of a New Race. And the introduction said, not long after Taramata had met Paramahansa Yogananda in 1924, she wrote the following article about a man who was blessed with the experience of cosmic consciousness. Though she humbly avoided identification with the person mentioned, the experiences of Taramata describes were her own. So she talks in the third person about this man and what he went through. This is what she experienced. She said, this man, with a well-read in the sacred scriptures of the world, knew that his intellectual knowledge was barren and stony. It did not feed the soul hunger within him. He did not wish merely to read about spiritual food, but to taste it. Under the even tenor of his days, there yawned a black abyss of despair. Despair that he was worthy of any direct contact with God, since no such experience was given to him. He finally came to doubt, not God, but the possibility that he would ever be able to have more than an intellectual comprehension of him. This conviction struck at the roots of his life and made it seem a worthless and meaningless thing. Into this dark night of his soul came the light of self-realization. After attending a few of the public lectures by Paramahansa Yogananda and before taking the class lessons, this man felt the heavy weight of despair lifting from his heart. Returning to his home one night from the last of the public lectures, he was conscious of a great peace within himself. He felt that in some deep, fundamental way, he had become a different person. An impulse urged him to look into the mirror of his room that he might see the new man. There he saw not his own face, but the face of Paramahansa Yogananda, whose lecture he had been attending that evening. The floodgates of joy broke in his soul. He was inundated with waves of indescribable ecstasy. Words that had been merely words to him before, bliss, immortality, eternity, truth, divine love, became in the twinkling of an eye the core of his being, the essence of his life, the only possible reality. He knew not with his mind alone, but with his heart and soul, with every cell and molecule of his body, the sublime splendor and joy of this discovery. The sublime splendor and joy of this discovery were so vast that he felt the centuries, millenniums, countless eons of suffering were as nothing, as less than nothing, if by such means this bliss could be attained. During the weeks of his illumination, illumination he felt no need for food or sleep, but he conformed to his outward life, to the pattern of his household, and ate and slept when his family did. All food seemed pure spirit to him. And in sleep, he was pillowed on the everlasting arms, awakening to a joy past all words and past all powers of description. He had previously suffered from a disease. Now his body was purged of all sickness. His family and friends were aware of great changes in his appearance and manner. His face shone with a radiant light. His eyes were pools of joy. Strangers spoke to him, irresistibly drawn by a strange sympathy. On the streetcar, Children would come over to sit on his lap, asking him to visit them. The whole universe was to him bathed in a sea of love, and he said to himself many times, Now, at last, I know what love is. This is God's love, shaming the most noblest of human affection. Eternal love, unconquerable love, all-satisfying love. He knew beyond all possibility or thought of doubt that love creates and sustains the universe, and that all created things, human or subhuman, were destined to discover this love, this immortal bliss that was the very essence of life. The air he breathed was friendly, intimate, conscious of life. He felt that all the world was home to him and that he could never feel strange or alien to any place again. That the mountains, the sea, the distant lands which had never seen, which he had never seen, would be as much his own as the home of his boyhood. During these weeks, he went about his daily duties as usual, but with a hitherto unknown efficiency and speed. Typed papers flew off his machine, completed without error, in a fourth of his customary time. Fatigue was unknown to him. 
His work seemed like child's play, happy and carefree. Conversing in person or over the telephone with his clients, his inward joy covered every action and every circumstance with a cosmic significance. For to him, these men, this telephone, this table, this voice was God. God manifesting himself in another of his fascinating disguises. In the midst of his work, he would suddenly be freshly overwhelmed by the goodness of God, who had given him this incredible, unspeakable happiness. His breath would stop completely at such times. The awe which he felt would be accompanied by an absolute stillness within and without. Underlying all his consciousness was a sense of immeasurable and unutterable gratitude, a longing for others to know the joy which lay within them. But most of all, a divine knowledge past all human comprehension, that all was well with the world, that everything was leading to the goal of cosmic consciousness, immortal bliss. That sounds like something we all want. That's what we're seeking. That consciousness in which we feel God's presence within and without, and in which we can help the world that so desperately needs uh, that vibration in it. Our guru said that those who go deep in meditation, those who um, practice and, and learn this, this art of yoga, they help the world. They help the world in a profound way. And that really is what uh, each one of us can and, and must do. Now this week you have an opportunity to, to practice these things, to meditate. Um, we don't have a gathering where everyone is together. But I really think, and we really think here at Mother Center, that Guruji's blessing will be felt by everyone who is sincere. If you take a little extra time or a little, make a little extra effort this week to meditate, to go within, to practice the techniques that you've learned, you will feel his presence. You will feel the, the help that maybe you have not felt so far. Master used to say, make every meditation, make every today's meditation deeper than yesterday's and every tomorrow's meditation deeper than today's, which seems on the outward, you know, looking at it, it's, it seems like, well, that's almost impossible. But if you really think about it, each one of us has the ability to meditate deeper today than we did yesterday. It's just one little step, one little step. And if we have that philosophy or that uh, uh, determination to do that, you'll find that as time goes on, that meditation becomes profoundly deep. You start experiencing that joy. You start understanding that um, pain doesn't affect you as much anymore. You're, you, you have an inner life going on and that you're experiencing a joy in what you're doing in life. Really the twofold path that our Guru said religion brings to you. Our Guru said, the science of religion is to make the effort in meditation until God becomes real to you, until you know that He alone is real. The science of meditation, that's as simple as that, is to make the effort in meditation until God becomes real to you. And he also predicted, he said, the science of yoga will take hold in this country more than any other form of spiritual seeking. Now he said this country, he means in the world, in the, you know, he was talking to a particular group, but it will take hold in this country more than any other form of spiritual seeking. The entire trend will be away from churches where people go only to hear a sermon and into schools and quiet places that where they will go to meditate and really find God. This is what the future brings, and we are forerunners of this. You know, we started with uh, sort of the history, going back to 1920, 100 years ago today, 100 years ago this year, to, you know, relive some of the things our guru went through in Boston before he got there. <laughs> I came across this interesting talk that Ralph Waldo Emerson gave 
Interestingly, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, he was a Unitarian minister. He, he sort of went away from his teaching and his, his uh, he became more of a recluse. He was fascinated by the Bhagavad Gita. He yearned for something deeper. But in 1838, he gave a very famous talk, a Divinity School address. And it was only about five miles, or let's say about eight kilometers away from where um, Yogananda gave his lecture in 1920. Let me read you this just short thing of what he was saying. He was, he was talking to um, the graduating class at the Divinity School. And he was telling them, we need more. We need more. Uh, you can feel the, the um, just the, the heart sincerity that he had. And it says, uh, this, this address was delivered before the senior class of the Harvard Divinity School on Sunday evening, July 5th, July 15th, 1838. Emerson had been invited to give it, not by the officers of the school, but by the senior class. He was a well-known lecturer, and they wanted, wanted him to come and talk to them. What Emerson said was so objectionable to the, many of the clergymen that the officers of the school publicly disclaimed responsibility for it. And nearly 30 years passed before Emerson was invited again to speak at Harvard. So he got himself in trouble with this. <laughs> but a portion of it, as he ends the talk, he says, the immo immobility of religion, the assumption that the age of inspiration is past, that the Bible is closed, the fear of degrading the character of Jesus by representing him as a man, indicate with sufficient clearness the falsehood of our theology. It is the office of a true teacher to show us that God is, not was, that he speaketh, not spake, the true Christianity, a faith like Christ's in the infinitude of man, is lost. And he ended his talk with this, this statement. He says, I look for the hour when that supreme beauty, which ravished the souls of those Eastern men, and through their lips spoke oracles to all time, shall speak in the West also. The scriptures contain immortal sentences that have been the bread of life to millions, but they have no epical integrity are fragmentary and are shown and are not shown in their order to the intellect. I look for the new teacher that shall follow so far these shining laws that he shall see them come full circle, shall see their rounding complete grace, shall see the world to be a mirror of the soul, and shall see the identity of the law of gravitation with purity of heart, and shall show that the ought and duty is one thing with science, with beauty, and with joy. I look for the new teacher that will show that ought and duty is one with the science, the beauty, and with joy. I can't help but think that Yogananda is that new teacher, that he came with a new dispensation. And the science of religion, um, which we practice to this day, which we've all been very fortunate to have from a, a guru who not only gave it as a teaching, but gave it so profoundly and so perfectly. This is what we're blessed with, and this is why we are um, celebrating maybe this, this 100 year anniversary of a great Western, uh, Eastern uh, savant who came to the West and brought a teaching from India. Let me finish with these words from our guru. He said, the mind is a perfect instrument of knowledge when you have learned to base your life on truth. Then you see everything in a clear, undistorted way, exactly as it is. Therefore, learn to experiment with this mind. Learn to follow the science of religion, and you can become the greatest kind of scientist, the greatest kind of inventor, the master of your own fate. God and Guru, bless you all. And we look forward to being with you this week during convocation. Jai Guru.